Uh, my name is Donald Robertson. I'm the Licensing and Compliance Manager at the Free Software Foundation. I've been there for about eight years. Uh, my background is in law. I'm a lawyer, but I don't uh, work as a lawyer for the foundation. I run our licensing department instead. Um, so what we're talking about here today is free software license compliance for hardware devices. Um, and the, the basic idea behind the talk is that there's a whole lot of people who distribute uh, free software on hardware devices and there's a growing number of smaller companies that are jumping in on this bandwagon as well um, and so this talk is supposed to be kind of like a basics for how to do free software compliance when you're distributing devices because um, unfortunately for a lot of people uh, although the stuff we're gonna go over is kind of basic and simple it it seems to be a problem within the community of <laughs> people who are doing it uh, but my hope also is if you're not someone who's distributing uh, free software on, on hardware devices is that you as a person who gets these devices will kind of know the sort of things to look out for for you know if you get a TV or something whether you can check uh, and see if they're meeting their the goals for compliance um, so it's, it's gonna be kind of broad-based some of it might seem pretty simple if you're already a law geek and you already know the some of the licensing basics when it comes to the GPL um, but I hope it will be uh, helpful and reinforcing um, so in terms of sort of the, the background of my talk uh, is this idea of, of what we call the principles of community-oriented GPL enforcement. So when I'm talking, I'm gonna be talking from the perspective of an organization that has signed on to these principles. Um, the principles were drafted together between the Free Software Foundation and the Software Freedom Conservancy, um, but there's lots of other organizations that are now signing on as well. Uh, and essentially the principles are a way of looking at how you do GPL enforcement. Um, in a way that respects the community and is helpful and beneficial to the community rather than exploitative or damaging. Um, and so throughout I'll be talking about GPL compliance but I'll sometimes, I may use the word technically sometimes and that just means that while something's technically a rule according to the license there's some, uh, not wiggle room, but there's some niceties or something that you can do if you are doing GPL enforcement in a way that is beneficial to the community. Um, and so yeah, so the, the basics of, the, of the, uh, the principles is that GPL compliance is an educational process. When I do GPL compliance at the FSF, um, we're not out there to make money off of people. We're not there to punish people. Uh, we're just there to help them to get the right thing done. So I'm kind of more like a teacher than like a lawyer. And that's really what I do is I, you know, some people need a little remedial learning on what they need to know about the GPL, and that's my role in it. Um, the, the ultimate goal out of enforcement needs to be uh, compliance so you could go in it with the goal of making money like you could start suing people and, and hope to get money out of it it's a very bad idea there's not a lot of money in GPL compliance um, but if you do if your focus is on getting people to actually release the source code it, it changes the outlook of how you do uh, your compliance work um, another big thing is uh, extending some of the, the protections that are built into GPLv3 that are, are technically not there in GPLv2. Um, we'll talk a, a bit more about that. Uh, but I want to lay that basis at the forefront because a lot of this talk is going to be talking about my experiences with GPL violators. Um, and so it's sort of the rubric that you have to understand uh, where I'm coming from when I'm, I'm talking about their failings. So free software and machine. <laughs> There was a time when free software was just something that hobbyists uh, downloaded to their own computers. Um, and that's you know ex essentially where free software existed was a bunch of people who were, were putting it on the devices themselves. Uh, maybe 15 years ago that started to drastically change where now the majority of free software is stuff that you're probably getting from somebody else um, that you may not even realize it um, because it's in a whole host of devices all around your home. So things like your router, uh, your DVRs, your TVs, um, even sometimes your cable modem boxes, or things like uh, these new Internet of Things devices, like your lights and things are internet connected now, and so they have a little bit of free software hidden inside. Um, so essentially, we went from a place where you had to bring free software into your home purposely and install it on your own machine, to where now a lot of the devices that you bring into your home come with free software installed already. Um, the final 
point on that is we also now have people who are working on our Respects Your Freedom program, uh, which is a certification program through the FSF to say that these are people who not only are complying with all the free software licenses, but that the device comes with just free software inside um, and that it respects your freedom as a user and doesn't spy on you or do other nasty things. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the newest wave of free software devices that are coming into people's homes or ones that instead of just being a device that happens to have free software on it, it's a device that explicitly comes with free software. Um, so as I go through this talk, we'll be, uh, we'll be starting out talking about the first kind of category of companies that just use free software because they realize it's really useful for their devices and they just want to sell a router so they don't want to write their own software. Um, and then once we get through their failings and the things that they need to be doing, we'll step up to the respects your freedom that will graduate up to the, the next level of free software on devices and, and discuss a bit about more about that program. And I, I put the principles in twice because they're really important. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we're talking about devices coming to your home with free software, um, the, the biggest, most common one is going to be the kernel Linux. Um, it's a part of your operating system generally if you are a GNU Linux user. Um, but for all these devices, you know, they're, they're smaller devices. They just need a, a basic system to run what's going on under the hood. Um, and they will very often have the kernel Linux um, that has other bits to it. So you've got your drivers, your microcode, and other things. Um, but that's sort of the, the base level of what's going to be necessary to, to make the hardware work. Um, then for, you know, you can't just have a kernel alone on a system. Uh, some people like to think that maybe Linux is all that's necessary, but there's actually a whole bunch of other tools that are required to, to make a system work. Um, and those come in the form of things like uh, GNU, GNU tools like uh, libc and uh, libgcc and gdb, um, or busybox uh, is another big one. Busybox is kind of uh, handcrafted to be smaller so it works well on small devices, um, as well as a bunch of other free tools. It's not just the copy left uh, software. Um, and then what you'll generally see as a user, uh, if you like log into your router or turn on your TV, is you'll see uh, a proprietary crap layer, which is just put on top. Um, so it uses all the, the free software and uh, tools underneath to load up uh, some piece of junk that they put over the front that doesn't work very well. Um, so, so. When we talk about the free software that is coming on these devices, um, it's important to think about GPLv3 and GPLv2. Uh, obviously, GPLv3 has been out for 10 years at this point. I think it'll be 10 years in June. Um, and the, but there's still lots of software that's under GPLv2. Uh, so, like for example, the the kernel Linux is still under v2. So when you're dealing with uh, compliance issue on a hardware device, you're almost always going to be having to think about what GPLv2 wants um, because the kernel will almost always be involved. Um, it's also the case that a lot of these devices are kind of small and lower powered and so they will, if they're using uh, GNU tools, they'll often use very old versions of these tools. You might be shocked to find out that you're running software from like 2005 in your devices, but it's, it's, it's still very common. Um, and so it's definitely the case that you'll find you know, stuff that's under V2, even if it is GNU tools that are now currently distributed under GPL V3. Um, but as things get bigger and better and time marches on, GPL V3 is also much more common these days. Uh, when I started eight years ago, obviously that was around the time when GPL V3 was just launching. There was very little GPL V3 involved, but these days you, you will find GPL V3 uh, in your devices. Um, so since we have these two big licenses that we have to think about, we want to know a little bit about the differences between the two. Um, so for one thing, they don't treat providing source in exactly the same way. One of the reasons behind creating the GPLv3 is that the GPLv2 is a little more strict in how exactly you're supposed to do source code distributions, um, which you know can kind of be annoying because the GPLv2 was written uh, geez, like almost 30 years ago now. So it was kind of at the start of the web being a thing and it didn't really anticipate how important uh, being able to put things on the internet would be for software distribution. Um, 
and obviously the GPLv3 recognizes that and has made some very important updates. Um, another thing that wasn't anticipated in GPLv2 was the idea that there would be these companies that would decide that they would like to use free software in their devices and they would like to comply with the GPL by providing the source code and doing all the things that are necessary but then make it impossible to actually install your modified software onto your device. Um, so GPLv3 has something called anti-TVOization, which is just a mechanism for making sure that that doesn't happen. Um, it, it's obviously named after a company that uh, was very famous for being one that went with that little uh, route around compliance. Although I, I shouldn't say around compliance, they went with a route that made compliance not practically useful. Um, and finally, the, the two licenses treat termination differently. So when you violate the GPL, uh, your license is going to get terminated, but how that happens can differ between the two licenses. Um, GPL v2, it's, it's a kind of stop dead in your tracks type thing. So when your license is terminated, that, that's it. <laughs> you're, you're in trouble, you're, you're violating the copyright. Uh, but the GPL v3 puts together some tools to make it a little s gentler and easier so that you're, you know, it smooths the process over for helping the people come back into compliance. So, now that we know some of the differences, let's talk about the places where people fail. Now, this stuff is, if you are a licensing geek, you're gonna be like, why, why are we going over this? But unfortunately, this is the stuff that I deal with um, in doing our compliance work at the Free Software Foundation. Uh, these are the, the most common problems that people will encounter when they're distributing. Um, it's also actually, these are common problems we have when people are initially coming to us to apply for our res Respects Your Freedom certification. Um, so even though it may seem a bit basic, these, these are important <coughs> points, and you may be surprised maybe that you don't know quite the details as they're supposed to be. Um, so the biggest one is providing source. I think we all kind of get that idea um, that you must provide source, right? If you are distributing free software in some form, you need to be sharing the source code uh, with your users. Um, but unfortunately, when we're dealing with compliance, that's often something that 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 level they don't understand that they they have received this software from somewhere they went and downloaded it they know it works on their machine but they never actually read the license in any mechanism so they don't understand that providing sources is a requirement at all um, obviously there are licenses out there like uh, modified BSD where source code is not a requirement um, and so people can kind of be confused that <laughs> that there is light software that does require uh, providing source um, the next big point of contention is that you must provide source. So if you are making and distributing uh, hardware that includes free software on it, you are distributing the software, which is the condition which triggers the need to provide source. So you actually need to provide the source. Um, what we'll often find is that people who they understand that source code needs to happen, they will assume that since they've just taken binaries from somebody else, that that someone else will handle the source code and we don't have to do anything. Um, in particular, uh, if they haven't modified the software, they'll say, oh, well, I haven't modified it, so the source code is already out there. People can just go get it from, from some third party, you know? Um, why do I have to do it? But the reality is that that's a requirement of the license, that you be the one to provide the source code. Um, it's even funnier when, it, when it's not the case that it's unmodified. They've, they've modified the software clearly, <laughs> but they don't get they They'll say, well, someone else has got this source code. Does it really matter that I've, I've done these changes and, and things to make it work on the device? Do I really need to share those? Um, and the answer is yes. You have to provide the source code. Um, Excuse me. Yes. And is it required to be provided as a box? Or <coughs> we got slides coming up. <laughs> mm. So the, the funny thing is with, um, you know, when dealing with these, these uh, violators who, uh, you know, they have an unmodified version and they're, they're saying, you know, what does it really matter? If people want to go get a copy of this software, they can clearly go get the source code somewhere else. It's available. Um, who am I really hurting by not providing source? Um, and what will often happen is once, once we get them to agree to the idea that yes, the license does require them to provide source, they come back and say, well, we can't actually find the source. <laughs> we don't know where it is. And it's like, well, that's, you know, that's kind of why you got to provide the source code is because you may not have 
be able to get the, the version that you had from before. Um, there could be other issues. The person who was providing the source code before could go offline. Um, you know, their source distribution requirements are already met by having it available for download, so they don't have to keep providing it. Um, or you may just not know where, where it is, and how are your users ever going to figure that out? Um, so that's why you need to be the, the impetus behind making sure that your users get the source. So how do we, how do we get the source to the users? Um, the most common way is written offers. Uh, people will, will generally do it. It's the, the, it seems like the easiest way to do it. Um, in some cases, it's, it's maybe not so much. Um, so a written offer on the GPL is, is just, it's a notice that you put in somewhere for the user that says, you're gonna be able to get the source code and here's the mechanism for doing it. Um, so the most common one is you're gonna get it in your manual. Uh, very frequently, if you, if you buy a TV or something like that, if you open up the user manual, it'll be in the back uh, saying third-party licenses, it'll have a copy of the license, it'll have a little notice saying, if you'd like to get the source code, please write to this er this address and we will send you a CD of it. Um, that can also be done in the user interface uh, if you have that on your device. So if you go to like about help or something along those lines, it'll have licensing information, It'll you'll have 50 million different licenses from a whole bunch of different things uh, and one of them will probably be the GPL and there'll be a written offer included there. Um, now, w one problem with written offers is that people kind of think of it as, oh, well, I've put the written offer in, so that's what I had to do. But unfortunately, the requirement is that you actually have to fulfill the written <coughs> offer. You can't just make the written offer. You must actually, when people write to you, uh, take the steps to provide the source code. Um, so what will frequently happen is people will say, well, we don't have the source code together today, but we'll put a written offer in, and then if anybody ever bothers to write to us, then we'll put it together. That's a very big mistake. <laughs> because what will happen is it'll be six months later, and the guy who <coughs> built the software or who knows where the source code was uh, has left the company or something like that, and someone will write to you, and all of a sudden you have to scramble to put it together, um, and it's, it's always a bad choice to wait. <laughs> you, the, the time to get your source code together is when you distribute, because that's the whole purpose, is that people will be able to get the source code from you. Uh, yes? You're obligated to supply the source code to anybody, or just the people who... Well, so that's the that's the other aspect of the written offer, is that the written offer is good to anybody who receives your binary, right? So if you sell a device to somebody, and then they go and hand it off to somebody else, that third party can now come to you for the written offer. They, so you can potentially end up getting tons and tons of people writing to you. Now, the thing about the written offer is you can charge a reasonable amount, right. so like five or ten bucks. So it shouldn't be too big of a problem. But um, one of the things is that you have to maintain that written offer for at least three years. So long, potentially long after you finish the cycle of that device, you know, you're not supporting it anymore, you're done with it. Um, you could have another couple years of having to maintain the source code somewhere and having someone who knows where to get it for that device from bef before. Um, that's a, so it's, you have to do it for at least three years or as long as you're offering support. So if you're offering support for longer than that, then you're going to have to maintain it longer. But if you're still offering support, it's not such a big deal because you're offering support on it. Um, Yes, so one thing about the written offer is there's a slight difference between V2 and V3. In V2, when you make a written offer, you have to actually send them something with the source code on it. So when they write to you, you're gonna have to give them a CD or something like that, um, which is kind of unfun <laughs> these days. Uh, I don't even have an optical drive on, on my device. Um, I, I personally would not want to get a CD mailed to me. I would rather get a download for it. Um, which is another way that you can do the written offer uh, under V3, which is that you can say it's available from this place to go and download, which would be the, the most common way that people, that's the way people want it. Um, and so even if you're doing a V2 uh, program, I would highly recommend including a link to where people can download it um, because almost nobody will want to get the actual CD from you. You do technically have to do the provide the CD for people if they do need it. Um, and I will say that 
at the FSF we do occasionally get people mailing us to just they want to get sent a CD for something um, you know, as a global organization there's people in countries where they don't have good internet and so downloading source code and things like that is is much more of a burden than just getting a CD mailed to you um, but that's uh, one of those differences between V2 and V3 um, Yes. The company can charge your can charge five to ten dollars. Well, for it's shipping. it's a re reasonable amount for for shipping the the CD to, to somebody, um, which five to ten is is probably generally reasonable. If it starts getting up there, it starts. You're not allowed to like charge people to get their source code, right? This is just the, cover the it's to the cover the cost, the reasonable cost of shipping it and and putting CD. it on a CD exactly. Um, yeah, we've we've had companies before where they're like, yeah, we're going to charge a hundred, and we're like, that eh, doesn't sound very reasonable. <laughs> you, you need to charge something that's in line with the the labor involved in the labor involved in burning the CD because you should already have the source code put together. And that was the problem in that case is they didn't, so they wanted to be like, we're going to charge a hundred because it takes this guy all this time to figure out what the source code is. And it's like, well, maybe they were planning to ship it on floppies. <laughs> yeah, ship it on <laughs> floppies. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it can get difficult. It's, you know, international shipping for some places is is quite expensive. So if you're if you sold something over in Germany and now your device has made its way to America and you have to handle the third party offer, you know, you never know. Um, so the other way to do things, which is much rarer, is to just provide the source with the device. Um, it, you, well, it used to be back in the day that it would be common that they would just throw a CD in the box. Um, that's for companies that figured out how to do it at that time. But um, it's not very common these days. People don't generally have CD drives. Uh, they don't want to put a USB key into the box just to provide the source code. Um, some people have done uh, providing the source on the device itself. So if like, you're shipping a laptop, you, know, you can just put a folder on the, the desktop that has the source code in it, and that's a, a pretty convenient way to be done with uh, handling your source. Um, that obviously doesn't work for a lot of the devices that you have free software on because they're so small and have such little memory that the, the memory is completely taken up by the image of the firmware and you can't fit the source code on there as well. Um, but it's, it's something that could be possible. Um, so now we know who's got to provide the source. We know where they got to provide it, but we haven't actually addressed what the heck the source code is. <laughs> so the source code is the preferred medium for modifying the software. Um, and so that's the, the human read well, <laughs> programmer readable <laughs> version of the code. Um, if, if, you're, if you're not familiar, so software is generally, it's written in a language like C or um, uh, a whole bunch of other ones or Fortran and then compiled into something called object code or machine code. Um, the machine code is right for the computer. It loves to read that, and that's how it will execute the, the program. Um, but for modifying it, you want to generally, you'll want to look at the, the nice human readable version, as we call it. Um, so for, for doing that, when you distribute a binary or a, a work in object code form, you need to provide the complete and corresponding source. And that means that they need to have all the source code that's needed to actually build the piece of software that has been distributed to them. And that's also going to include your build scripts and things like that, because you know the software doesn't just exist by or the source code doesn't exist by itself. It takes a little bit of working to attach the different files together and make them all work uh, into a, a single package. Um, so you also need to include the build scripts. Um, and one one problem that's pretty frequently uh, an issue is that it needs to be corresponding, meaning it needs to be for the version of the software that you're actually distributing. Um, something that we'll run into is that people will they'll violate, they won't have the source code, so they just go and grab any version of the source code and try and offer that up as the complete corresponding source. Which, it may be complete and nice and usable, but it's not for the version that the person is looking for. Um, and so that's something. That's another one of those reasons why you need to get your, your compliance worked out at the start and not try and wait to do it later, because you may not realize. Um, uh, particularly, I guess it's good to point out, so when someone's just offering a download of object code, they can just offer the, the source code right there alongside it. And so that's a pretty frequent way that people will, will deal with free software. They got the, you download the executable, and you got right next to it is the link for the source code. Um, but so what can happen is, so they that person is 
complying with their license uh, criteria by doing that. But if they get rid of version one and move to version two, they don't have to keep having version one source code up there anymore. And oftentimes they'll they'll take it down because they're like, ah, well I'm I'm done with it, and now it's time to work on version two. So I'll have version two's <coughs> corresponding source code. Yes. So uh, with regards to the source distribution, is it applicable for uh, copyleft licenses only, or is it? Uh, yes. If you have a package that's a mixture of copyleft licenses with something like MIT BSD, do you have yeah. to supply source code for all of them, or just for copyleft? Yeah. So sorry, I, I guess I wasn't being clear. We're talking about for the copyleft stuff, particularly we're talking about GPL license software here, at this moment. For software under other licenses, um, there can be other licenses that have source code requirements, um, but a lot of them won't. Like if you're dealing with a pushover license like the modified BSD, there's virtually no conditions on it, so you don't have to do anything. Um, and so because you don't have to do anything, it's not really a concern for your compliance because <laughs> there's very little that you can do that will make you not comply with those licenses. Yes? And so far you call it explicitly GPL, but I assume it's in like with LGPL. Yeah, we're going to talk about LGPL uh, in a little bit. We're just going we're going with the GPL stuff because it's, it's a little more involved. Um, although LGPL violations are, are very frequent. Yes? But the fact inspection could also maybe entail libraries and such and not. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk a, a bit about libraries in a little bit. It's I maybe didn't organize it in the best way, but uh, this was kind of the, the GPL is kind of the, the big dog in, in terms of the issues that we have uh, with people and, and what they're doing. Um, so finally, um, you're also gonna need installation information. And this can be kind of confusing. The installation information, it's like a technical term at a GPL v3, and it really means it's the anti tvoization stuff. It's the keys and the scripts and other information that you need to actually install the software onto the device that has come along with it. It's called installation information because it's the information that you're gonna need to be able to install it. Um, that doesn't mean that the user has to be able to actually do it because obviously um, the user may not be able to understand the stuff and whatnot. And it's the same with building source code. You're not required to teach them everything. You just have to give them the tools so that they can figure it out themselves. Um, now this is something that's required in GPL v3. Um, but we will often make it a condition of restoration if we're dealing with a mixed uh, bag uh, violation that obviously if, if people have the keys for installing GPLv3 software, they'll be able to install their other software on the device as well. Um, oh my, how did the time go by so fast? Uh, so, termination. So we've talked a bit about the things that you need to do to comply with the license, but if you haven't done that, you're in violation, and that's going to cause your license to terminate under the GPL. Now, I, I mentioned before that under GPL v2, uh, termination is automatic on violation. So if you've distributed a, a piece of hardware with some GPL v2 stuff on it, your license is cut off right then when you haven't, when you failed to comply. And the only way to get your license back is to go through the copyright holder of the software that you violated on to get that restored. Um, GPL v3 says, you know, that's, that's a bit wonky, especially because a lot of times the person whose work you violated on may not be ready to deal with your, what, you're deal, what your problems are or to, to get you back in compliance. Um, and so it has a, a graceful termination, which is essentially that after you get notified, you have a little bit of a period where the first time you violated on it, you can go ahead and correct that violation. Um, and so if you correct it, then your license is reinstated unless the copyright holder comes back and says, no, I didn't like your violation and you are terminated. Um, so it's kind of a legal technicality because it's essentially you're, you're in the place where the copyright holder can still come and, and get after you for your violation, but if they don't bother to, you have the, the legal footing to say, well, my license was reinstated, so my future use until they came back to me was okay. Um, and I mentioned before that uh, under our principles of uh, uh, GPL compliance, that when we deal with someone who's under a GPL v2 violation, we treat it the same way as if, as if it was a GPL v3 violation where, you know, if they can correct the violation within 30 days, then, all right, fantastic, you did your work. Yes? Are copyright holders allowed to terminate licenses outside of, like, non-compliance? Or how does that work? Uh, you cannot terminate, if you give someone some software under the GPL, you can't just terminate it willy-nilly because the GPL 
gives them the terms of what their license is. So the termination has to go through that mechanism. You so know, if there's something else, they, they can't terminate the license. So I guess what I'm asking is, like, if you're if you're violating GPL B three uh, work, and then you come into compliance in the, in the like ninety day period or whatever, does that then mean that for like the rest of time, the copyright holder has the ability to then like cut you off? Um. On something other than a, a violation, it's a good question, but I, I think well, the answer because is of, because of because of the violation. Because of that violation, because yeah. So it's it's a copyright violation. Um, so they can come and bring suit at uh, at a later point if they need to. Um, but w what GPL v three does is it says that you get your license provisionally reinstated um, until the copyright holder comes back and says no. Because what would happen is, is that you would violate, some other third party would explain to you, oh, you're violating, you'd fix it, and then you'd always have this threat hanging over your head that every time you continue to use it, that you would be violating again because your license was terminated, right? Right. Yeah. So this is a way that your license is provisionally reinstated so you can continue to work on it. And then the only issue would be, okay, you did have a violation back there that there may be consequences for because it's a copyright violation. Um, but instead of having every subsequent use being a potential source of liability. Does that make sense? No? So, so if I understand correctly, that means that if, if you uh, happen to violate, whether for ignorance or whatever, yeah. then from then on just perpetually you're under this threat and the, the license being pulled from under you. Um, I don't know if that... I guess I would use the word technically that the, you, you violate a copyright. It's just like if you violate the copyright on someone else's work, mm -hmm. that you're always under your, until the, the, the statute of limitations expires, there's gonna be a threat that they're gonna come and sue you, right? That's, it's not a, a particular thing to the GPL that's all, all licenses. If you, if you do a civil infraction, even if it's not copyright or something, you know, if you break someone's arm or something, they could sue you at any point up to however many years it is for the statute of limitations to run out. Uh, it, well, it depends on what the infraction is and where what state you're in and things like that. So in case of violation, what would be the year? Um, I'm not sure on uh, copyright. It, it might be seven years, maybe. I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't looked in a long time. Uh, but, you know, that's not something generally – that's not usually what the problem is. <laughs> like, in, in, in most cases, the problem is just that you, you want to have your license – you don't want to have the, this be sitting in the situation where your license is terminated, so you can't continue to use the work and distribute it while these issues get sorted out. Um, and that's what GPL B three's uh, graceful termination handles is that you provisionally get your license back. So that that means that so you fix the the thing, you're not violating anymore, so you can keep you you're reinstated, so you can keep using the work. Because uh, otherwise, your your lawyer would be like, well, our license was terminated, so we just have to stop distributing. The GPL software completely, um, but so this graceful termination thing, I think it is confusing because for some reason a lot of companies think it means that they have either 60 or 90 days to comply. So what they'll do is they will be releasing updates to their their software, um, and then they won't actually provide the source code for 90 days because somehow it got mistranslated what the GPL v3 is saying. Um, that's not the case. You need to comply at the time that you are actually distributing it. Um, the graceful termination period is uh, for your first time. <laughs> That's the first time you violate, you get that graceful termination. Uh, subsequent violations, you don't get to take advantage of that. Um, so doing this thing where you're violating every 90 days uh, is not a good idea. Um, I'm guessing some lawyer at some point said that, that that was what they could do because a lot of companies have, have when people write to them saying, hey, I need the source code and you're giving me the old version of the source code, I want the, the current version for my phone or whatever it is, they, they will write back as a stock answer from the customer service that we have 90 days to comply. Um, but that's a mistake. <laughs> it is not correct. Um, so LGPL. We asked about it before. You, you're going to find lots of LGPL stuff on devices as well. We talked a lot about the GPL stuff. But LGPL is definitely going to be involved there. Um, the key thing there to understand is the LGPL is not a BSD. It's not a pushover license. It's not one of those licenses where you can just take the software and do whatever and not have to, to really think about any of the requirements. Um, you know, if you're if you're providing LGPL software to people, you do actually have to 
provide the source code that goes with that. Um, so a lot of people don't realize that. They think, you know, because they, they do kind of view it as if it's a pushover license. Um, if your proprietary or other software is linking to LGBL software, there's duties involved with that in terms of notification and being able to relink those uh, libraries so that people can modify the library and relink it with the binary that you've, you've built for yourself. Um, and those can that can get a little more complicated. Like I said, we we're going to do kind of basic stuff, but when it comes to linking and, and other sorts of issues, the derivative works, now they work together. It's a little more complicated, but essentially the, the big idea to take away from it is that LGBL is not BSD. You have to think about what you need to do. Um, and, and honestly, if you just read the license real quickly, You'll, you'll realize what has to happen. Um, it's going by so fast. Um, so this is kind of concluding the, this is the, the problems that I deal with in my GPL compliance work. Um, people don't provide source code. Um, if they do provide the source code, they don't bother to do it at the right time. They don't distribute it. Um, if, if they get to the point where they are distributing it and they're doing it at the right time, they don't bother to get the correct version. It's not the corresponding source, or they only give you part. They'll give you the source code, but not the build scripts. Um, and finally, the installation information. They'll give you all the tools that you need, but except for the ones to actually install it on your device, uh, which would make it useful to have that software. Um, but so when someone's violated, I work with them to bring them back into compliance. We go through all these steps and we get them to the point where now your device is compliant. Um, so what, what is next? Uh, going beyond that, we have our Respects Your Freedom certification program. Now, the people who pass through our compliance program, they're meeting the requirements of the license. They come out and they're no longer in violation of the license. But for people who really care about freedom, they want to take it a step further, and so they want to make sure that all the software on their device is free software, and that users can get source code for all the software, not just the ones that they're legally required to provide. Um, and so we've created this certification program to make it easy for users to find out which companies are distributing hardware that meets that criteria. Um, so far, we've had uh, a couple dozen or so uh, devices that have met our certification requirements. Um, there's a wide variety of different uh, devices available, like laptops, routers, 3D printers. Um, we even got one of our ROAF folks here, with Chris uh, from Think Penguin. Um, and it's run through um, fsf.org slash ROAF. So if you're looking to buy hardware, that's a good place to go check out. These are people who are, are doing a whole bunch of good stuff. Um, so meeting the criteria, one, Everything on the device needs to be free software. They need to be giving, you know, not just like the partial sort of free software, like when we deal with like Ubuntu or something like that, where it's like mostly free, but then there's some stuff that's not really free. Um, it also needs to have free documentation. So the documentation has to be under a free license that people can modify it and share it. Um, even further, like our endorsed distributions like Triskel, GNU Linux, it needs to not recommend non-free software to people. Mm -hmm. So it can't be a thing where you buy the hardware, it doesn't work at all, and it says inside, oh, just go download all the proprietary drivers and this thing will work great. Um, it's not enough to just remove the non-free. You have to make it so that when someone gets it, they know uh, this is going to work reasonably well with my free software. Um, and finally, it needs to respect privacy in other ways, like even if it's free software, don't put spyware on there. You know, don't be doing nasty stuff and tracking them on the internet. Um, so, uh, for these hardware devices, we're talking about free software. Um, if we're looking at like a laptop or something like that, it's kind of easy because you can take one of the endorsed distros like uh, Triskel GNU Linux or Parabola and you can put it on a hardware device and that's going to be like 90% of what you need to do. Well, 90% of the software that you need to do. <laughs> there's, there's another... Um, oh, so... On top of that, so even if you're not dealing with a laptop where you can just grab one of these endorsed distros, um, a lot of people don't know there's there's another ver version of the kernel Linux called Linux Libre, and that's just the uh, kernel. It's just the, the kernel Linux with the non-free bits and binary blobs removed, um, so it's totally free. 
uh, and it's done by a whole group of volunteers that work on making sure that it's up to date. Um, so even if you're doing a device that you know isn't going to be a, f a full operating system like Triskel, which comes with Linux Libre ins installed already, you can know that all right, if I'm going to get my device to work, it needs to use like Linux Libre. Um, and finally, there's Libreboot. Uh, so for a lot of laptops, the the booting software is non-free. Like a lot of times, people will have like a fully free operating system on on top, but then when they they boot it up, it's this nasty software that phones home to Intel or somebody else. Um, and so the devices need Libreboot, which is a fully free uh, system for for boot code. Um, there's a couple special situations. Um, there are things like secondary processors, which are like it's like a processor built for like your optical drive or some other little pieces that can be inside your laptop. That the when you install something like a fully free operating system on it, it won't necessarily replace the code that's on there without doing some extra fiddling. Um, and the software that's hidden inside there may not be free, but it's uh, we work with people to work out whether we can strip it out or whether special exemptions need to be made on what what exactly that software is doing. Um, so that's just kind of clarify when we're saying it's it's completely free software. There are these little tiny bits where there's like hidden things where we have to like figure out exactly what's going on. Um, but if you were to apply for RWF, we would help walk you through that process. Um, the other thing is non-functioning components. Sometimes you'll have a device that will 90% uh, work with uh, free software, but then something like the camera actually doesn't function. Um, you know, it's a thing where we have to work out, well, if it's non-functioning, is it something that can be removed? Or is it something where if it, if it doesn't function that people will end up just going and, and feeling like they need to go install proprietary software? Um, so it's like one of those things we kind of have to negotiate about whether whether this is a device that with lacking this piece, whether it will meet our criteria, essentially. Um, the other thing is there's devices that just, they don't come with any software. You know, they're like a little dongle or something, and the, the software is actually on your laptop. You, when you plug in, it's, it's run by the, the kernel or something like that. Um, those can often meet RYF criteria because they will work with fully free software, but they themselves don't actually come with any software. Um, so. For people who are coming into RWF, and I hope you guys, after this talk, are realizing, hey, this, this hardware stuff is maybe not so hard when it comes to compliance, and maybe I, I want to try and sell some hardware devices and do some RWF stuff myself. Um, so getting started on, on the RWF process is knowing the compliance basics, which was that first half of the talk, which I, I hope that didn't seem too scary, right? That seemed pretty simple stuff, right? Yeah. It's, it's amazing how companies can get it wrong so much. Um, the other big thing is to know the components in your device. Um, I was just talking with uh, Chris earlier before about how sometimes even when you think you know your components, you may not necessarily, <laughs> depending on your manufacturer. But uh, knowing what components are, are involved and what kind of software that's involved. Um, another big thing for our program is that we, we don't want you recommending non-free software otherwise. So like if we tell people go to this person's website and buy a laptop from them, we don't want them saying, hey, buy Windows as well on the side. Um, we also ask that they not use proprietary software on the, the website either, so no non-free JavaScript, things like that. Um, in terms of the, the process, uh, once, once you've kind of set out and like, okay, I've got the basics, I'm ready to go, um, we go through an application process where we take a bunch of information about what it is you're trying to do, what the sort of software that you're using. Uh, we go through and review that, see that there's not already, like, oh, you actually have a bunch of non-free software and, and hidden away and hit already. Um, and once we get through that process, we have devices sent to us where we actually review the device to make sure that what you said is going to be happening with it is, is what happens with it. Um, sometimes there can be miscommunication about, like, you know, this is the device that we're reviewing as being, this is the device for the customers, that what they will be receiving. So we want to make sure that um, that you don't actually after the fact at some point be installing some non-free drivers or whatnot. Um, and then finally, you know, we go through finalization certification. Uh, that process, it's four lines, but it actually takes a bit of time because some of these issues are more complicated. Um, this has been kind of a basic overview, but there can be kind of more edge cases and things that uh, need to be worked out. Um, but, so, for our RWF program, uh, coming up, we've got Lots of new devices. There's tons of people who have applied. 
uh, with a wide variety of different devices and all kinds of cool things coming up. Um, we're also looking to expand to more retailers in different countries. Um, there's some in Europe, there's some in America right now, uh, but in the rest of the world we're kind of lacking, so we want to make it easier because it is expensive shipping laptops across the country, or across the world, I mean. Um, and finally, looking at devices produced with freedom in mind. Uh, a lot of the devices right now are refurbished things where they take things that we know work with free software and bundle it together and sell it to people. Um, but we're really excited about people who are actually making new hardware that is built from the ground up to, to hopefully work with free software. Um, so that's, that's kind of the overview that we kind of go from here's people who are using free software in their devices, but they don't realize they're using free software. And once they realize that they're not complying, and once they're complying, they're not doing it quite right, to people who are now getting to looking at compliance, not or looking at free software as the main goal of what they're working on. Uh, my big hope is that I get to combine my two areas of work where my compliance program goes, all right, now you've got to, you're back in compliance, we can restore your rights and finish this process, and you're graduating and just taken off right into respects your freedom. And we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna go all the way from you've done nothing correctly to you do everything correctly. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but that's definitely one of the things that I'm really hopeful for for the future. Yes, you had a question? So, uh, with coming back to the to LGPO, yes. I working through version 3, there's uh, the same thing about termination, et cetera, as with GPL, right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, version 2.1 is its own license, but version uh, 3 is actually, is actually just the GPL, is an exception to the GPL. Mm -hmm. So, LGPL v3 is, is the GPL with an exception that makes it work like the old LGPL v2. Um, so a lot of the stuff from GPL v3 is inherent in the in LGPL v3. One more question about that is, yes. can you tell anything about the, there's uh, something I've read about patent, uh, something known patent and provisions or something like that? Yeah, so that, that is uh, another difference between GPL v2 and GPL v3 is that GPL v2 existed prior to software patents. Mm -hmm. um, and so it doesn't address them uh, explicitly. So there's implied uh, provisions for, you know, if you're gr granting someone a license to use software under copyright, um, there's a possibility that there's an implied grant to not get sued for patent violation. But GPLv3 comes in and says, we want to make explicit that when you distribute something under GPLv3 that you're getting a, a, pat a grant on the patent license to use it as you would as if you're just using it under GPL v3. So it's not some special extra, sometimes people get this idea that the patent grant in GPL v3 is a grant on all your patents for everything, but really it's just a grant that's essentially saying people want to use it under GPL v3. It's just like under GPL v2 where people are going to share it and modify and do all these other things. So they want a patent license, so they're not, not worrying that they're going to come back and get sued for a patent violation. So, so that applies only to Yeah, that's correct. It's for it's for the uh, contributor version. It's like when you add, when you release or distribute the code, uh, the patents that you have that would cover the version as as it is like that, those patents are licensed. So people can go and modify it, and as long as they're only violating those that little pool of patents, they'll have a license for those patents. If they modify it into another patent that wasn't found in the original uh, version that they distributed, then you're kind of out of luck on that one. Do we have other questions? No? Go ahead. Um, he would be more clear than I am on this. Uh, <laughs> are companies using like regulations, like FCC regulations, to like not distribute code saying, oh, well? Yes. Yeah, and I wanted to put a, a, a footnote on the installation information section because it's very relevant um, that the new FCC regulations on like wireless. Um, uh, Essentially, the FCC wants to lock it down so that people can't modify their wireless devices to uh, bleed into other bands of, of wireless spectrum that they're not supposed to be into. Um, and so the, the general, what people have been doing is, is locking down their devices and making it so that people can't install their modified versions. Now, if they're doing that with GPL v3 software, they're going to have a problem um, because it's not going to work. Um, but if they're doing it with GPL v2, that doesn't have those anti-tivoization provisions. In it. So it's a problem for the user, 
um, but it's not a problem for the company distributing. Um, well, they're still stuck with old GPLv2 versions of stuff instead of being able to use more modern GPLv3 versions. Um, but yeah, if you see people doing GPLv3 where it's locked down, you can you can write to me at uh, lvviolations at fsf.org because um, that, that would be a problem. But my understanding is they're just using old v2 stuff and trying to avoid it. Um, but there are people working to, to figure out ways to, to get around it. Um, yeah. Right. I attended See. We're trying. They they like finally a year and a half ago. This all this FCC yeah. stuff is going on, but they they have not submitted a new router mm. until now, and they're like asking me for help, and I'm like, geez, I don't know. So the kind <laughs> of what I get from people is like, lock it down. You know, we yeah. we want people to flash their yeah their stuff, but yeah. um, it's a little confusing. You know, so you lock it down, but leave a workaround for geeks. Or something. I, I that seems to be what. People, I don't yeah, know. I I mean. I th geeks will always find a way. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. 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 Were there other questions? I yes. did. So, actually, on that, like, let's say I wanted to make my own custom ID thing or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I'm gonna have to pay all these certification costs and and all you know, all the all these things. What well, well, if I have to supply the source and the means to download the code? That doesn't really make any more sense to me. I, I guess it's on this. Like, what, what are you guys doing, or how how did that work in that sense? Uh, can like, you say it again? Like I, I build, a, I, I build my own custom ID, and I pay for all the certification. I, you know, distribute the product. I have to distribute the source and the means to download the code to it. But someone could break the code, or sorry, uh, change the code, and now my device becomes FCC not compliant. How would I? <laughs> like who, who's who's going to be? In oh, who's, who's going to be in violation? Are they going to come back to me? Or? <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to lock it. it depends right. if it's what five gigahertz. You're supposed yeah. to lock it down, but. I, yeah, I mean, if 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 you, I I can't tell you what would happen if if you've done some means that they said was good enough to lock it down and someone breaks it, um, but they don't specify it. no, yeah, they, they probably don't. Yeah, and 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 honestly, it, it's one of those frustrating things. But this stuff could all be changing again very mm -hmm. rapidly. We have a new new folks at the FCC, so you know. So we have some similar. We have devices that go on tr heavy trucks mm -hmm. and talk to vehicle bus. And that's going to make it super simple and for anybody to, to install it, stuff on those. It's, so it's, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's actually interestingly complicated because it doesn't specify routers or embedded devices. No. It would also apply to laptops, but nobody's locking down the CIE right. slides except for the several big companies, Dell, HP, or whatever, it's usually Apple and Sony. Everybody else is not locking the PCIe slot down, so you just lock in a, a card that the 5 gigahertz card is. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it's 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 silly nonsense to the, to the nth degree because there's a million other ways that people could be violating this stuff, mm -hmm. and this whole idea of the government using what is essentially DRM to try and lock people out from to essentially enforce their laws is is absolutely absurd. We had an, another incident where um, the EPA uh, wrote to the copyright office to try and make sure that they did not grant uh, DMCA exemptions for vehicles because they didn't want people to be able to tamper with their uh, emissions control devices. And they they wrote to the Copyright Office about that about a month before that whole deal with uh, Volkswagen, who had been tampering <laughs> on their own, and whose DRM on their system had prevented researchers from discovering uh, the, the fraud that they'd been committing. So it was like, Complete irony of the, yeah. you know, the government agency sure. saying we want to use laws to say that you have to put technical measures in place that enforce the law, um, even though those technical measures actually prevented people from catching the real wrongdoers who were doing it on a massive scale. Yes. Did they did they say anything about that after the Volkswagen incident? No, <laughs> they they never brought up the fact that they had they had written this letter to the, the copyright office. Uh, trying to deny that stuff. I wrote a whole bunch about it. You can go see all my nasty <laughs> things I did say. I believe I called them DRM drones. Yes? So I was kind of thinking about it. Wouldn't it be reasonable, the closest approximation I have in my mind would be the DMCA safe harbor status, where it's, well, okay, that's not quite close, but basically, if you're FCC compliant, we, we've set that for you, but then you use your campus worker, there really ought to be the user's problem that they're Yeah, that, that does make the most it's sense, not doesn't it? Yeah. It. 
Yeah, and that's I mean, and that's the thing. That's and the, like it's it's the, the it's the same thing with the EPA is that if if well in the EPA case the manufacturer was actually violating themselves, but if if it shouldn't be the government trying to use these technical protection measures to enforce these laws, like they should be able to be like, okay, we can go to the company and make sure that they're doing it right, and then if we want to go and make sure other people are doing it right, there's got to be better mechanisms than trying to put on these these measures which don't work by the way we all know that DRM is, is very crackable that whatever uh, things they put in place unless they're literally burning the software onto these routers and things people will be able to figure it out and to be able to modify it and, and do what they want to do um, it's all spinning wheels because people don't really understand how things work I guess cause these yeah. routers to go out of compliance via changing the antennas on the routers so any yeah. idea that locking the software <laughs> down yeah. is going to yeah. you know solve the problem is <coughs> Yeah, it's, it's somebody talking it's, it's, out of, you know <laughs> yes. what? I find to figure out a better analogy. It's almost like taking, it's like buying a car from a dealership, let's just say the Ford dealership. You buy the car and you modify it. It's not street legal anymore. Who yeah. in their right mind would say it's Ford's fault that the car is no longer street legal? The EPA. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what that's the, the EPA well, want, I mean, wanted people to, know, to put DRM thing, on their, like, their systems for, for that exact Amen. thing, yeah. Um, our, no, it's a definitely. Is, you know, it's not so much somebody installing their own stuff on there. It's making it secure against hackers and big, you know, attacks on vehicles. Or that's that's more of the, that's where that's our concern. Where where are you from? A company called Road IQ. We make vision systems and Okay. Yeah. Well, the vehicle communications is another one. Uh, they're mm -hmm. trying to do a DRM type of thing on it. Yeah. And I get that, but I, I think history has proven that um, you know that type of security doesn't necessarily lock it down especially when you're talking about something where you still have the keys to it um, which is generally the case but the user themselves doesn't have the ability to, to modify it themselves because um, what what will often end up happening is that the if there's one point of failure and it's big there's a lot yeah, oh of yeah, failure yeah. that comes out of that sure, right yeah. yeah you know I mean that's the thing with a lot of these different things where you know like we had with secure boot um, where it's you know these companies locking it down but then people are like okay well what if we're able to sign our own keys like it makes sense to be able to have security where you have a restraint on your own machine that as long as you're the one who's in charge of those keys and gets to decide okay I'm gonna be the one to install the, the other software like there's no problem with having security installed it's it's a problem when that security is in place to uh, be under the control of the person who distributed it and not the person who's actually using it when it's yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Securing against the user rather than securing against the outside entity. Uh, so I think we're we're technically at time. Uh, thank you guys all for coming out. I hope I hope this was interesting. I was worried that maybe it would be too simple, but th these really are the the types of problems I, I went through. Those are the ones that people face. Uh, even people who are coming to do RYF certification for the first time, they may not know all the you know the kind of the basic details. But I hope that it was uh, helpful to you all, and that I hope you're excited about either checking your own devices to see whether they're compliant or uh, you're maybe thinking that hey maybe I can do this too and I can get out there and start sharing hardware that uses only free software with the world. So my again my name is Al Robertson with the Free Software Foundation and uh, thank you all for coming.